uh, six o'clock, so uh, we'll get going here. Uh, hello, thank you everyone for joining us for uh, the first webinar in the series that uh, the Cedar Falls Seed Library and Green Isle AmeriCorps are putting on, on environmental and uh, issues and things like that. Um, this one is uh, Water as a Resource, uh, Rain Barrels and Rain Gardens at Your Home. Um, and uh, we have two speakers here. Um, we have Maria Perez, a stormwater specialist with the city of Cedar Falls. Uh, she'll be talking uh, about uh, the rain barrels and Josh Bach from Dry Run Creek Watershed uh, and the Blackhawk Soil and Water Conservation District. He'll be talking about uh, the rain gardens. And uh, the way this presentation will work is first we'll have Maria give her a presentation with times for a time for questions and answers afterwards. And then Josh will give his presentation with time for questions and answers. And then Felix from Green Iowa will keep an eye on the chat. Um, so if you have a question that you wanna ask and you don't wanna forget about it while they're giving the presentation, chat, uh, put it in there and Felix will be sure that, it, that it's brought up. And then um, at the end, uh, after this is all over, uh, we will hopefully have a survey for you. Um, so if it doesn't work on this, then we will send you like a survey monkey or a Google poll uh, please fill that out. Uh, that helps all of us know what we're doing right, what we can do better, uh, your level of knowledge before and after. And then also uh, by participating in this, you can win uh, a rain barrel converter kit. So if you would like that, please put in the chat somewhere your name and yes, that way we know that you would like that converter kit. Uh, okay, without further ado, I'll give you uh, Maria. Take it away, Maria. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we disabled the chat between people and their videos just so we can make sure um, we we have this under control. But if you have any any questions, you can chat them to any of the panelists. So I'm gonna try to share my screen. Can you guys see it? Okay, perfect. So um, we wanted to name this pre presentation water as a resource. And the reason is because many times water is seen as a nuisance instead of a resource. And with these two uh, methods that we want to discuss today, we hope that you start seeing the rainfall as a good resource instead of a bad thing sometimes. So I think you're answering this question now, correct? Uh, uh, Felix, perfect. So one being nothing, fine being an expert, how much do you know about today's topics? Just keep answering that and Felix will record that. Okay, so I wanna do a little introduction. I would say half of my presentation will be just about rainfall in general, about the stormwater program and half will be about the rain barrels and you'll see why. So we all know about the land transformation that Iowa has had and to me, I am from Colombia originally, and it shocked me because you know Colombia has a little part of the Amazon rainforest. We also have another area, other areas that are really pristine, and but we also have really developed areas. And it shocked me when I came to Iowa, and a lot of Iowans think this way. We think Iowa is pretty natural, but actually, it's one of the ecosystems that is more modified in the whole world. And that's shocking. So what's the modification has been, how it has been? It used to be prairie right before European settlement. Most of it, 85, 90% of it would have been prairie. And we know that that has, that's not the case now. We only have about 0.1% of the remnant prairie. I was calculating today how much could we have as prairie or grasses. And I did that just looking at the land in CRP and it's less than 5%. So at the most we have four and a half percent to 5% in something similar to prairie. But most of it is row crops. It depends on the area in the Cedar Valley, in the uh, Cedar Basin is about 93% in row crops, but it, it depends on the area. And then the transformation now also in more urban areas goes from row crops to just um, cement in urban areas. 
So this has a lot of consequences. And the ones we're going to focus on here are more the hydrological or water consequences. So what happens when it rains in the prairie is really different to what happens when it rains in the pasture, in the crops, or in the urban area. And Preparing for this presentation, I, I love math. I'm an engineer and water engineer, and I was like wanting to do a little cock. So I said, okay, I'm gonna assume some things and I'm gonna assume we have a okay soils, not the best, not the worst. How much rainfall would I get in different landscapes? So this is something I did today, and but it's just to demonstrate what happens with water. So if we have a rainfall of 2.5 inches, which happens every year is a large rainfall, but it's a rainfall that repeats itself every year. I mean, has a probability of repeating itself really often. Uh, in the prairie, in a good grassland, you'd have about 0.2 inches of runoff if we have a two and a half inches of rainfall. So I said, okay, let's look at agriculture with the same soil condition. What would I have? And with that two and a half inches, I would have 0.65 inches of runoff. So a lot more, two and a half, almost two and a half times what you would have with the grass or the prairie. Now, if we put that in urban, it's really different, difficult because it depends on how much percentage is impervious. But I said, let's put a 60% percentage of impervious just in average for the urban. And that gave me one, in point, one inch, 0.18. 1.18 inches of rain or runoff. So that's 13, almost 14 times the amount that you'd have got in the grass or in the prairie, or almost two times the amount that you would have got with the agriculture. So sometimes people think, well, what's the deal? I'm just going from crops that are already bad to urban, but it is a big difference when we go from agriculture to urban. So what's the issue with more water or more runoff? Um, well, one thing is it causes erosion in our streams. Our streams are not um, expecting or have not evolved to have this fast runoff. And with that, it brings a lot of sediment that has consequences for, for instance, nesting sites of fish and fish population. Of course, more water, more runoff, less infiltration generates a flooding. Again, erosion issues, but not only problems for the streams, but for our infrastructure, we have to update. And you'll see in my presentation how much money we spend updating this infrastructure. And anything that gets in the parking lots, in the floor, in the rooftops, in any place gets into the water, making it a water quality issue that can result in things like fish kill. So water quality and water, and water quantity are affected by this change in runoff. So because of issues like this, the Cedar Falls Stormwater Program was created. And I highlighted, this is from the website, so I apologize about the text, but I just want you to know like all of this is an ordinance, you can find it on the website, but I wanted to highlight what do we do or, or why are we here? What's our goal? And the main thing that the Cedar Falls uh, Stormwater Program needs to do is that we're just required to have it. We need to address the mandates that the federal government gives us by the Clean Water Act. So we have to have this program. And with the program, we try to do a few things. One, reduce the manage and reduce the potential for runoff pollution. So we want to control pollution. And I just kind of um, briefly explain some of the issues. But we also want to concentrate on promoting health, safety, and general welfare of people uh, and property. This is also related to like uh, flooding, for instance. So those are some goals. There's many goals. And I would say if you're interested in this, I advise you to go to the stormwater management program in the website and see, OK, what, what is the city supposed to be doing with this? And why are we spending money on what we do? And those are the reasons why. So um, I am the stormwater specialist for the program. So I deal a lot, mostly with the construction part, construction and education parts of the program, but there's much more that goes into the program. And the person um, that has to do more with the management of the program and design of decisions of what we're going to do is the city engineer, which is David Wicking. So if you have questions about things that go that I don't have control about, David is the person to uh, contact. 
and then Chase um, Schrage is the director of public works who it goes above David. So this is kind of like who deals with the stormwater program, who makes the decisions on where money, for instance, is. So I get often the question, what happens to my $3.50 that I pay every month for stormwater? So right now you're paying a household is $3.48. Uh, in July, it's going to go to $3.65. And that's as high as it's going to get unless we pass a different ordinance. So what happens to this? Well, we get it together and we get about, for this year, it's budgeted that we're going to get about $950,000 with that. But we also have other ways to get other income for the stormwater fund. And um, that's just permit. Uh, when people are going to build, they need to get a permit and they need to pay for that. And that generates about $25,000, or we think for this year, 2.5% uh, of the budget, and then interest that we get. But the most of what we do uh, comes from the money that we all pay. So what have we in the budget for this year with that money. So I wanted to show this again, because that's a question I get, what happens with my money? Uh, about, so I want you to see, for instance, the purple is the biggest one. The big, big project that we have budgeted for this year is the Olive Street culvert. You may be heard about it, is, I'll talk about, about it a little bit in, in a minute but it's the biggest project we're gonna have. The other bigger expense is just uh, paying staff like me, there's about five and a half people covered in the stormwater fund. So my uh, son was hearing me rehearse and he's eight and he said, how come half people? I mean, so he was a little confused. He, he was worried I was under some safety concerns there for his mom. But anyways, five and a half is only me full time. And then a person that does sweeping full-time uh, street sweeping. And then the three and a half is little, I mean, chunks of different people. But that's the other main main cost or the trucks we drive or the computers, all that stuff. Um, the other expenses that we have is uh, for sewers, for repairing sewers, and that's about 5%, so 82,000. 82, and uh, we have also like studies, drainage studies, another small one. And the other one that is smaller is what we have budgeted for uh, permeable alleys. So I want you just to see, that's what we have budgeted, but what gets in the budget is not what gets done. So I ask, what have we spent in the last years? Oh, sorry, before I go there, this is the biggest expense that we have and is the Olive Street covert. There was public participation open for this, it's already closed. But I, uh, since it's the biggest project, I wanted to share it with you. So on College Street, we have this plaza that is called Peterson Plaza. And here is the Dry Run Creek. Can you see my cursor when I move it? Perfect. So the Dry Run Creek is here. And what happens is that there's a lot of erosion in small area here. So the project proposes to extend this plaza and make just pave, put the, the stream in a cover, in a pipe, big pipe and expand this. So how it would look like would be more like, a, I don't know, just like an area for people to walk over the creek. And that's the, the bigger project that we have. So I wanted to show you that. But again, that's what is budgeted. We don't know if it's going to happen or not. So I ask what we have spent in the last couple of years. Uh, so in the year 20 and 21 uh, fiscal years, and this is actually what has been spent. Um, the main money, the most money or the biggest project was for the Walnut Street Box Culver. So culvert replacement, when I tell you like a lot of water, we need bigger infrastructure, or it creates erosion and issues. That's where our money has to go to replace this and it's expensive. So hopefully we could find ways to, to reduce that, that would cost us less. Uh, the other big expense was for the uh, Clay Street um, drainage. And they had to replace a lot of the pipes because there were really old pipes there. And they also added uh, good, two good biofiltration areas, a huge one and a small one in a permeable paver, a permeable alley. So that's another big part. And the other big part that we already spent was in permeable alleys. The city is doing about three a year. So those are the bigger expenses. So for instance, in the Walnut Street uh, box covered, it used, this is the picture 
one year ago before the project. And if you, I was trying to see what was the change and what you can see here, the measurement of the width in this is about 24 and a half feet. And when it changes, it's about 33.3 feet. So they make them much, much bigger. And you can see all this erosion control in the banks. And that's an expensive project because of this. So that's um, what has happened. This is the second project that we spent about 300,000 on. Uh, part of the money came from um, a grant, um, state grant, but also part came from the fund. So here's the permeable alley that uh, was placed there. And it's similar to the permeable alleys that you might have seen in other places. And here is the bioretention area, which is like a huge rain garden. So Josh will talk about rain gardens and this would be just like a big rain garden. So that's what the city has done, but what can you do? What can regular citizens do? This sounds so fun, seems fun to go to an outdoors festival. Someday we will do it again, but this doesn't seem so fun. Just sandbagging and you may be remember that and that's why we think oh, we go and we help when we need to but what about helping before that hopefully i think really the main thing that anyone can do to help is to contact elected officials so for instance the um any project big project will have input take input from citizens so be try to be uh, aware of these things it's hard sometimes but that's important and just contact any of the elected officials and say hey i like to see more of these or can you explain to me why this happens and I, I think that really that's where the city takes the direction from all of us now if you're concentrated on water quality and i care about water quality because these are my beautiful kids uh, fishing in the dry run creek we need good water quality to have good fish and, and just experience be able to recreate so few things you can do if you want to help with water quality and there's too many here but let's concentrate on few of them um, one of them is be careful with fertilizer or herbicides. Pick up what you don't need. And right now, it's salt. If you put salt and then it's after the storm and there's salt left, pick it up and reuse it later. So anything that gets into your pavement is going to get into the street and that's going to get to the stream. So that's a big one. Don't wash your car. Just stick it to a car wash washer because they can put that water in the wastewater treatment plant. So that's better. Um, and just few things compost i mean there's many things careful with your duck poop huge thing for dry run creek is bacteria so just pick it up so those are things you can do with water quality one that helps me a lot is call me if you see anybody putting anything in the creek or in this in the sewer it goes to the creek so that's called an illicit discharge only rainwater can go to the uh, street even sometimes you might be seeing like a pipe with clean water that might come from a pool, but you cannot put any pool water because of the chlorine level. So just let us know. Or construction sites that don't have good uh, controls, just call us. You're the eyes for everybody. So let us know. Now, if you're like more worried about water quantity, a lot of uh, citizens call me because their yard is flooded often. So what can you do? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Not only the local um, area is important in your home, but just remember that that causes erosion and flood downstream. So if the issue is that everything is connected, that's why we are getting so much water at once, because all these rooftops and the streets and everything goes fast to the, to the stream. So what we need to do is to disconnect this. How can we disconnect all these impermeable surfaces and send them slower to the river. One way is with rain barrels, many ways we have, but one is with rain barrels and I'll talk about it. And the other would be with rain gardens and Josh will talk about it. So installing rain barrels is an easy way to help. And it's, um, I have to say, I, I don't have one. I have one that I haven't installed after preparing for this presentation. I will want you all to come by my house and see my rain barrel working in May. Uh, pretty easy, you can make like a stand. You just need to make it tall enough to fit like a um, bucket in there, under there. So that's what you wanna make sure that happens. Um, and you can install one or two. A lot of people just uh, put them together and install two because you will see that uh, one rain barrel is fills really quickly. 
but some people go all crazy and install many. And in areas of the country where it's dry, you can really benefit from this economically. So it depends. Now, Cedar Rapids has these cisterns in the library that are huge. So the size depends on what you can do. And when I tell you, uh, you can be part of this by talking to elected officials. I mean, just give them ideas. Let's do things like this, it's cool. And it helps um, all of us. So what are the, some benefits or considerations to have? The main thing is free water. I wish to tell you that you would save a lot of money because water is expensive, but we know that water is cheap. So, however, it's anyways, you're saving some um, in free water. Now, I look for plant growth and it does seem that the pH is better for plant growth and also uh, some of the elements are better for plant growth. So that, that's beneficial. But there's also some concerns of what could be in your roof for plant growth. So um, I looked it up, should you do a water test? And they, uh, the answer that I have for you is not to worry. When different, I'm sorry, this is my dog. When different people have done water tests, um, they have found that there's really no worries, uh, no need to do it, uh, no concerns. The main thing for me, the main advantage of a rain barrel is that it's the cheapest and the easiest option to help reduce runoff. Even if you don't have a rain garden or a garden or anything to put the water, just waiting until after the rainfall is passed and releasing the water little by little uh, can help a lot. Sorry. So that's that's the main help that I would say. That's the main option. However, it's free water, but do not drink the water. Definitely not even for pets. Now, if you're gonna use it for plant growth, it's better to really water the the roots, not the not the Sorry, kids, uh, do not water the leaves. A lot of people recommend to adding bleach to the water and just look the amount, it's really a small amount and it helps for killing the bacteria if there was an issue. You do have to disconnect it for the winter, otherwise it could crack. And again, you can let it trickle after the storm. And even if you just put it in pavement, if you don't have any, it helps just because it will reduce that peak uh, of the storm, after the storm. So how big or how many? It depends on the goals that you have, how much you wanna help and the rainfall. And that's where I also spend quite a bit of time looking at statistics. So I look at the Waterloo precipitation for 10 years and try to look how much does it rain uh, from April to November, that is kind of when there's water, not ice or snow, or at least I took that. And, and it varies, of course, depending on the year, but the 50% of the times, the median, which is the value that is 50% of the times is 30. So 30 inches a year between April and November is what we get here. It varies also depends on the month. And this is for 10 years, I looked it up. So, and I look at the, again, median at each month. And you can see that the uh, wettest month is June, but most of the months are around three or below inches per month. So that was important. So I said, okay, well, let's, let's look at June and at July. And I look at five years or six years for this and try to look at how, I mean, how many times if I want to, get 50% of the rainfalls for June is I have to make sure that I collect 0.5, um, that, that the rain is at least 0.5 inches. And for July, which is a more typical is 0.46. So in a typical month, I said, okay, let's go with July, okay? So if you get your roof area and you multiply that by the rainfall and do a little bit of conversions, you get how much you're going to collect. So let me explain this really quick. And if you have paper and pen, I'll tell you in a minute what to do. So I said, okay, a typical home, let's say it's a 1,000 square feet roof and you have four uh, different downspouts. So let's divide that in four, it's 250 square feet. Uh, I got, got like 50% uh, rainfall of 0.46 inches and I did the conversion. To get 50% of the rainfalls in a roof of 250 square feet, you need 72 gallons. So 
rain barrels are usually 50 to 55 gallons. So you would need one or two depending on that. So you don't have to remember all of that. The only thing you're gonna do is think of the rainfall that you wanna capture. Again, it could be, it could be any of these. If you wanna capture most of them, 90%, do it at 1.2. Uh, or if you wanna just capture, I don't know, 30% do 0.3, it's, it's up to you, but this is just a guide and I'll put this for you. I'll, be, uh, I'll have this available for you to see. But what you can do is say 0.6 or 0.62 if you wanna be more precise, but times your roof area that you're gonna capture times your rainfall, that gives you the volume. And that's when you have to decide how many rain bar barrels to get. Now, where do you get them and what are the prices? Any place. The truth is few stores carry them on the stores. So most of the stores you have to order them and they send them to you and most of the shipping was free. So I look at Walmart and prices went from $80 to $170 or more. There's some really crazy rain garden, rain barrels. Um, Home Depot, same thing, 87 to 120 in those ones. Menards, same thing, 80 some, 100 some. Menards and Home Depot also carry these rain barrel converter kits that are only $30. And again, that's one of the ones we're going to be raffling today if you're interested. So that's an option. It could be as cheap as $30 if you get a barrel that anybody has. Now, if you don't the, do, your, do it yourself, I was really worried about this um, installation. And there's so many videos, even the same company that I'm gonna give you the kit with has many videos. And really the only thing you need is like a saw to cut the downspout. Now with this one, you don't even need the saw cause it has, um, you only need a drill basically, a drill and all the things that they have. So depending on the, on what you're going to go, you're gonna need just really minimum materials. I love how pretty they can be and you can get super artistic, but I tried to do that in my own and it chipped right away because I did not follow the recommendations. So these are the main things that you have to remember. You should prime it with some primer good for plastic. You should use acrylic paints and you should use a sealant. If you do that, it will be better, it'll, it'll last longer. But again, that's just something to add to make it more beautiful. Now, one resource that I really liked when I was looking at things was this uh, Green Neighbor Guide from by the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Chicago. So I recommend that resource and they have a whole like book on all these uh, things and, and it was pretty well explained. And one of the things that they include is rain garden. So that's where Josh is gonna go there in a minute. But before that, I just wanna give you a minute or like, a, let's do a minute. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat and then we can go there. While you think about the questions, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna put my screen in this. So you maybe have time to write it down if you need to. So Felix, you tell me if we see any questions. So far we have some shy people, so let's see. Don't worry, if you want, we can also do questions at the end when Josh goes. Josh, I... Okay, so that's perfect. So I'm rain bar barrels at Menards and Cedar Falls and Waterloo. Do you have a rain barrel that you, do you recommend? I really don't. Josh, do you have any any one that you recommend more than other brands or things? Um, I would say, you know, the, there's so many different styles out there. So get one that you like. I mean, you know, if it's going to be uh, off your back garage or back shed where no one's going to see it, you probably don't need a fancy one. But if you're putting putting one, you know, in your front yard right by your door, you might pay a little extra to get a fancier one. Um, so it's really personal choice. Um, but all of them, I would say, um, you know, they're, they're about similar quality. Some are a little thicker um, than others. Um, so you might I'll say, especially if you have the chance to actually go to a store, uh, inspect one. Um, I definitely also recommend reading reviews. Um, but um, like I said, there, there, there's any number out there. So I just get the one that, that fits your, your personality and home the best. 
Perfect. Thank you, Josh. Molly, um, so you're asking if it's a good idea to collect water from sump pumps. And it, I guess I'm not sure what the question is, and I, we can let you talk maybe if you want to um, talk. Felix, you can see if she can uh, talk. But but what I, so some pumps we have had um, some ideas mostly to put them towards rain gardens that Josh is going to talk about. Uh, the good thing with some pumps is that the water is usually groundwater that is really clean. It's, it's great water because it's better than the roof water. There's also some dry wells that you can do, and I'm not sure if you can connect the sump pumps to that. So in, in summary, I wish we would use the sump pumps better and collect it because it's just adding more to the rainfall that is going to add more to the runoff that is going to add more to your sump pump. So it's kind of a cycle. So if, if you can disconnect that, it's great. But um, there's some issues with the foundation too that people have to be worried about. So maybe just chime in real quick because I know I spoke with a gentleman here. It was probably just last year. And uh, that's exactly what he looked at doing. Um, you know, he connected his sump pump overflow um, into his basement and hooked up three, three or four 55 gallon drums and kind of put them up on a level. And um, he was uh, figuring out a pump system so he could pump it back outside. So he would have an option uh, during the, the summer months when he needed to water his garden. You would have that fresh, clean, cool groundwater that's already filtered um, in good condition. Um, mm -hmm. So he, he did that. Um, that was a little bit beyond my plumbing skills and ability, um, but I know I, 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 there are plenty of resources online uh, with lots of YouTube videos and stuff like that. So if that is something you are considering, um, I know there, there are quite a few resources out there on using some pump water uh, and collecting and gathering that. Okay, I think that's good. And I'm excited to hear some of you have rain we barrels. Have one, we have one more question, I think, uh, oh, from good. Bruce. It says, what can be done to keep rain barrel water clean because scum can get formed? So again, bleach is one thing. And the other thing that I uh, read was in the kind of inlet, you can put a filter thing. And some people use uh, stockings, like the women's stockings kind of thing to keep, um, Thanks from getting into the rain barrel. Josh, any other things that you can add? Um, so I know one other thing that, that's commonly talked about with rain, uh, rain barrels is a worry about mosquitoes um, forming in there. And so uh, a really simple additive you can do to prevent mosquito uh, larvae from growing in your rain barrels is either adding a little bit of oil, um, vegetable oil, or something like that, or um, dish soap, because um, both of those create a nice surface over the, the water that's in the rain barrel and prevent um, uh, mosquitoes and their larvae from being able to grow and develop in there. So I think that's another common additive in rain barrels. And one thing with mosquitoes is also to remember that it takes about three to four days for them to hatch. So just as long as you can keep it within those three days, try to get it clean, then you should not have that. Uh, we have one more question that actually came in through the Q&A from Katrina. Um, yes. Are there any studies to reference that there have been conducted on the safety of roof runoff for vegetable garden irrigation? So there are, there are a lot. I tried to look for a meta study, so looking at the different studies and I couldn't find one, uh, but the ones that I found totally fine, found it that it was uh, good. There were only concerns if there was copper on the roof. And what they do is that they recommend, if you're gonna do it for gardening, they recommend to do like a first flash, which is like the first time it rains uh, or the first 0 0.2, 0 0.3 inches of rain, just throw that away, don't use that for gardening. So there, there are different options you can have, but in general, they were not more concerns that um, actually there's more concerns using just the tap water. So anything else to add in that, Josh or Felix? No, um, looks like all questions. One other one other thing that, that's concerned about uh, roof uh, runoff is the bacteria that Maria kind of touched on, especially if you have a large roof or, you know, you're in a area that has lots of birds. Um, you know, that can create E. coli. So that, that's why they definitely recommend, you know, like Maria said, to put it at the, the base of the plants or on the soil 
and not directly on the, the fruit of the vegetables. Um, and if you do that, uh, you should be just fine. Your plants will like it too, so. Nice, so I think those are all the questions. Uh, Josh, are you ready to talk about rain gardens? Yep, I'm ready to rock. Okay, so let's try the screen share option here. Okay, can you folks see that? All right. Okay, so I really like the title uh, Gardening for Water Quality because um, that's what our goal is with rain gardens. Um, we're utilizing um, quite a few different features. Uh, we're using the landscape, the water that comes onto it, and then we're trying to improve local water quality. Um, so, you know, Marie did a great job kind of setting this up talking about uh, stormwater and a lot of the considerations with it, because um, it's something that affects all of us. And, you know, we might think that, oh, I just have this small home. It doesn't uh, contribute that much. Uh, but just with uh, uh, the average size home, we're going to go with a thousand square foot home and an average size lot. And we're going to make our magical rainstorm come through and rain exactly one inch on this house. And so just the amount of water that's coming uh, and runoff from the rooftop is about 900 gallons during this one inch storm. You add in your average size driveway, that's contributing an additional 500 gallons. You have a compacted yard where water doesn't really infiltrate well, that's a significant contribution with over 2,600 gallons. So altogether, just a one inch rainstorm on an average home uh, can, can, can shed off about 4,000 gallons to our storm drain system. So if you think in the Cedar Valley area, um, that's close to 130,000 gallons of water uh, just from your home. So when you think about all the homes in our community, uh, that really adds up to a lot of water. And then, you know, the other thing is where we're seeing uh, climate drift and changing weather patterns here in the area. So we've had wetter years here recently. And Iowa specifically, we've kind of seen an increase in the average amount of rainfall anywhere from six to eight inches. And there's projections that could increase. So um, the amount of water we're receiving in our area um, is, is, is kind of being affected by that. And that's when I get calls from, from homeowners who uh, did not buy waterfront property uh, but are, are dealing with that in their backyard. Um, there's a lot of water and not a lot of places to go. So that's when we come up with these wonderful solutions with things like rain gardens. And, and like I said, this is kind of trying to harken back to um, the native Iowa hydrology and how water used to have a chance to get into the ground, to infiltrate, to slow the system down, a lot of what Maria was talking about is really what our goal is with rain gardens here. And so rain gardens themselves, um, you know, it's nothing complicated. Um, it's really just trying to uh, design a, a beneficial landscape feature. Um, so these are strategically placed in the yards. Um, you know, it's not just the, the bottom spot in your yard the, where all the water goes to. Um, the, the, there's some considerations we'll go into more detail on. But really, we're just trying to capture an amount of that, that stormwater coming off from the roof or the driveway or the sidewalk or the road, direct it to these rain gardens, um, give it a chance to, to temporarily pond there, you know, usually less than 24 hours. So that way that water can work its way into the ground. And rain gardens themselves, you know, it's, uh, there's a little bit of work into the des design and installation. Um, but then once they're established, it's not much more work than, than average landscaping. All right, so um, we've uh, partnered with many residents here in the Cedar Valley to install rain gardens. And um, each one of these photos is from a different rain garden that we've installed over the years. And you can kind of see the vast differences between all of these. Um, some of these were done by professional landscaping companies. Some of these were installed by the homeowners themselves. 
some of these only cost a couple hundred dollars and a day's worth of labor, whereas some of these took, um, you know, multi, uh, multiple days with, with uh, contractors getting these done. Some of these were very inexpensive. Um, and some of these were more expensive. And each one of these fit the, the homeowner's need, uh, what their goals were, what their landscape features were. Um, but really, they all kind of have the same defining features for a rain garden. Uh, we're directing water from the downspout, giving a chance to pond, work its way into the ground. And we have pretty, pretty flowers in it. So this is a nice uh, infographic just to kind of show off how a rain garden works. We have our rain uh, water come in down by uh, precipitation. So you know, water uh, accumulates, goes downhill. So we try and intercept that water runoff and have it fill up our rain garden. Um, we only want a portion of that water in the rain garden. We don't want to treat the whole storm or an excessive amount. Um, so uh, excessive water will run on down outside of the rain garden. But the water that stays within the rain garden and has a chance to pond in there, that's what is working its way through the soil profile. So it'll percolate and infiltrate down and can even help recharge groundwater. And here in the, the Cedar Valley, you know, we rely on well water from deep aquifers. So giving that water a chance to recharge is important. Um, and sometimes we have enhanced rain gardens designed. Um, so we might include under drains or overflow options for those really heavy rainfall events. Um, but then we have our wonderful native prairie plants in there that also help uh, absorb the water, take it up, transpire it. Um, so this is a much more functional system, like I said, uh, akin to our native prairie uh, Iowa heritage. So um, I'm really excited to announce um, that um, everything, you know, if you only pay attention for one slide, this is the one to, to check out this evening. So yeah, wake up, take your coffee, take your notes here, um, because we, we've had a rain garden manual that was uh, developed, um, I think, in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, and has been a resource for homeowners, for conservationists like myself, and is really just a one-step uh, or one all encompassing guide of how to do a rain garden, all the considerations, everything that I'm gonna talk about this evening is pretty much included in this rain garden manual. Well, just last week, um, it was formally announced that we have the updated guide that just came out. Um, so um, you can go ahead and download it for free. Um, I think for a short period, it's uh, available to download uh, also free through Amazon Kindle. So you can go ahead and um, get all the information you need if you go to that iowastormwater.org and uh, go to the rainscaping and the rain garden and you'll have the link to that. Um, but like I said, this includes all the details I'm going to discuss this evening and go into more detail. So, so some of the considerations with rain gardens, um, you know, just like uh, retail and property and all that stuff, you know, it's all about the location. We want to have these rain gardens included in the area that's going to try and help the water quality. We don't want it, um, like I said, that clear at the bottom or anything like that uh, of your yard. Um, we don't want it in the wettest spot of your yard. You know, we need to avoid utilities and trees and kind of all that stuff. We also want to make sure it's not going to cause issues uh, draining back to your house when it overflows. So there are some considerations with the location. We also need to investigate the soils, make sure that uh, your, your property is set up for these uh, rain gardens. And then we can kind of do some um, mathematic working with the, the size and the, the depth of the rain garden. All right, so talking first about the site selection. So there's this really cool feature on the EPA's website. Um, you can do a home stormwater assessment and um, you pretty much just type in your address kind of just designate out the area of your property and it'll give you very detailed information. Um, you can help calculate the, the amount of hard surface on your, on your property, taking into your driveway, your house, that kind of stuff. Um, it can tell you detailed information about your soils, calculate how much water is running off your property. So that's a really cool feature. So yep, if you just do uh, EPA home, stormwater home assessment, or if all that link there, um, that'll get you all set up. Um, another thing to consider is, you know, we're trying to treat runoff from these hard surfaces. 
So calculating that is not always easy. If you wanna be out there with a yardstick or a tape measure, you can go right ahead. Otherwise, there's some um, useful resources we have here online in the Cedar Valley. So if you're a Cedar Falls resident, um, you can go to the Cedar Falls GIS online. Um, this is a free service uh, online tool that they provide. You can zoom into your home property and click up, uh, designate out how much hard surface you have there. They have these useful measurement tools. Um, so like I said, that, that does a really great job trying to uh, do those rough calculations. Um, if you happen to not live in uh, Cedar Falls, but you're within Blackhawk County, you can use the Blackhawk County Assessor's website. Um, you can type in your personal address and then it'll come up with a detailed plan for your home, kind of just uh, designating out the, the approximate measurements for it. Um, so that'll help you kind of figure out the, the amount of roof um, area you have draining to each downspout. Okay, so another good idea um, to try and help you figure out how much area you have draining, um, go out during a rainstorm event, bust out your umbrella and kind of just see how the water flows on your property. You know, do you have a, a hill or a slope where it's coming from your neighbor's house? Are you, is your water running off down to your neighbors? And kind of just see where this water is going. And especially if you have a nice sketch pad with those squares, that can really help you kind of designate out um, all the trees, um, the, the buildings and all that stuff, and kind of help you get a better idea of where might be a good place to put in a rain garden. Um, so another important thing is to have your utilities marked, so that way you know you're going to be digging near your, your internet line or anything like that. Don't want to lose uh, power for an evening, that's no fun either. Um, so another thing is we, we want to be, uh, because we're encouraging water to get into the ground, you don't want it right next to your house. So having it at least 10 feet away from your foundation, but ideally if you can have it 30 or 40 feet away from buildings, um, that's ideal. Um, you also want it away from your sidewalk, from septic systems, and from private wells. So those are just some considerations on the, the siting of your rain garden. Um, the next step is to do to figure out your soils. So there are some useful tools online. Um, you don't even have to bust out a shovel. You can just use your mouse and try and do some uh, research. So if you uh, do a Google search for web soil survey, you'll get linked to this um, service provided by the US Department of Agriculture. You go ahead and type in the address of your home and to designate out your area of the property and it'll tell you the, the, the soil types um, that, that have been uh, designated for your area. And then you can run a soils report and it'll give you detailed information about each of the soil type within your property, uh, it's drainage, um, you know, how much of uh, or what the depth is, estimated depth is to the, the groundwater. Um, some very useful information. So like I said, that's a free service. Uh, just go ahead and follow your, uh, your mouse and let that do all the work. But you can't just rely on those, um, those online tools. Um, at some point, we'll kind of need to, to get out, get your hands dirty, but that's the fun part of rain gardens, um, getting your hands dirty and uh, doing some work. So there's a few different methods. Um, probably the best one for investigating your soils is a soil percolation test. And so this, um, you're pretty much just, uh, I guess, yep, I should definitely highlight again, always before you dig, go ahead and get one call. It's a free service. They're out there marking your utility lines within 48 hours. Um, so, so yeah, I would say always do that first, but for the, the soil percolation test, you pretty much just dig a hole in the ground. Um, you can use a small shovel, you can use a post hole digger, if you have an auger, you can go ahead and do that. Um, you just want to try and go maybe two to three feet down, and that should give you a good idea of what you're looking at for soil. So if you notice lots of clay, you know, if it's really tough to get in there, if there's lots of gravel in there or rocks, um, that can give you a good indication of what soil type you might be dealing with. Otherwise, if you see really black um, dirt uh, or soil, I should say, we don't call it dirt, we call it soil. Uh, if you see nice black soil, uh, looks healthy, that's usually a really good sign you have a good site for a rain garden. So just the simple test you'll do is um, over a couple day period, you'll go ahead and fill your hole with 
12 inches of water and just see how quickly that, that water uh, goes down through the hole. So you'll kind of just do some, some notes and calculations. It's not like you have to set your lawn chair up and watch it uh, the whole time. You can go out and check every few hours um, and just see how quickly that water is going down because that's going to tell you how quickly the water is going to go down in your rain garden. And once you know that, um, I would say that can help tell you what you might be looking at for different types of rain gardens, how big it might need to be if you need to oversize it and stuff like that. So sizing your rain garden, that's an important thing. I think that's the most common thing. How big does my rain garden need to be? And it depends, is always the answer. Depends on how big your roof is, how much uh, the downspots coming through there. Um, so um, based on your soil type, um, your soil percolation test, it can kind of tell you there's a little bit of wiggle room. Um, so if you're kind of restricted on, on how much room you have for a rain garden, you can maybe kind of dig it a little deeper um, and create more of a ponding depth. Otherwise, if you have a wide open air in your backyard, you're wanting to devote to a rain garden, you can go shallower and kind of size it up that way. Um, but that's where your percolation rates will kind of help determine about the, the percentage um, from your roof downspout that you'll need. So 10% of your roof uh, drainage area is pretty average for what we size for our rain garden. So yep, if you have you know, 500 square feet draining um, through one downspout, you'd be looking at a 50 square foot rain garden. So that, that's pretty standard there. Um, but uh, the new rain garden guide has uh, this wonderful new calculator. You can actually go ahead and type in what you're finding for your roof. Um, so your roof drainage area, um, how much water's coming off from the yard, and you can kind of just type these numbers in there and then it'll spit out uh, the results for what you need for the, how big your rain garden would need to be for it. So like I said, it saves a lot of the guesswork, uh, making sure you're doing things right when you can just type in uh, what you're able to find there. So I'll, I'll go ahead and highlight that, yep, there's two different types of rain gardens. If you have really good high quality soils, um, good soil percolation tests, lots of good organic matter in there, you can just do a basic rain garden. Um, so this is one where we rely on the existing soils in there. Um, we pretty much just ex ex or dig out uh, the bowl for the rain garden. Um, we'll maybe bring in a little bit of amended soils. Otherwise we just rototill um, what's already there, add some mulch on it, throw our prairie plants in there, and then we're, we're good to go. If you're fine to through it through soils investigations, you maybe have more clays in there and it doesn't quite drain into the ground as good, we might need to get a little creative with it and do something called an enhanced rain garden. And so that involves a little bit more work. Like I say, you're digging a little deeper, you're maybe bringing in more um, higher quality soils in there, kind of amended the soils there. And then we usually have to do some type of overflow structure. So that's a, a, a perforated subdrain um, with a non-perforated inlet on it and then just directing that, that overflow water elsewhere. Because the goal with rain gardens, we only want water in there for a short period of time above ground. We want it to work its way into the ground. We don't want it there for more than 24 hours. That way we don't have any issues with mosquitoes. So these, these overflow structures help ensure that's the case. Okay, so a lot of people, you know, I don't anticipate that there's too many landscapers um, here on the, on the line. So don't worry um, if, if you never uh, landscaped your yard before, there are wonderful ideas and options out there for what you can do for your rain garden. Um, they come pre-labeled with all the plant species you can have. So a nice diversity of plants, uh, shapes and sizes. Cause like I said, the rain garden, this is really the cool part of the rain garden customizing it to fit your home where you want it and, and making it work for you. So you can use lots of natives, you can use fewer natives, you can get shrubs in there, um, lots of different options. And all these ideas are included in the, the newly updated rain garden guide. Okay, so coming, knowing what you're getting into with the rain garden is really important. And another new feature of the guide is a material list. Um, so to help you figure out how much topsoil you need, how much compost you need, how much mulch you're gonna need, um, how many plants you're gonna need. Those are probably the, the four most common aspects of the rain garden and, and 
coming up with a budget to make sure you properly uh, set enough funds aside for it is really important too. And there's lots of ways to wiggle around with this. Um, you know, you can choose uh, getting plant plugs that are maybe only three inches tall, um, and that can help save you money. Otherwise, if you have more money to spend, you can buy larger gallon size plants. Um, so, um, you know, if you're concerned about how much the mulch is going to cost, you know, the city of Cedar Falls and the city of Waterloo have free mulch available that you can utilize in your rain gardens. So that's some of the, the ways you can maybe uh, cut the cost corners here. Um, but like I said, the, the new guide kind of helps you with that, figure out how much of each material you're going to need there. All right, so yeah, have your plan, you have uh, your materials, you're good to go. Here comes the magic day, it's time to install the rain garden. Well, it comes through with four easy steps. Um, first, you're just gonna lay out the, the area for the rain garden, make sure you measure it. Um, you know, having some spray paint or some, some markers are really good to help visualize, make sure you're happy with it. Then comes the, the wonderful work of, of busting out a shovel and, and getting your hands dirty excavating out the rain garden, usually going uh, 12, 12 inches uh, is kind of the, the average for most rain gardens. You have to do that enhanced rain garden, you might have to be digging deeper. Um, so once you have your rain garden all uh, excavated out, then you're going to come back with adding those higher quality soils in there. You need to rototill those together. Um, then you go ahead and add the mulch and put the plants in, and then you end up with a beautiful garden like this. And so I'd say a lot of times, you know, if you have a couple people helping you, you can get a rain garden knocked out in a day, no problem. Otherwise, you have to just set aside a, a full weekend just to make sure you have enough time for it. So uh, a few um, features of rain gardens are really important to make sure it's going to be successful for you. Um, having the rain garden level is really important. So each step of the way, when you're excavating, when you're adding the materials back in, making sure it's level um, is just going to ensure that all the rain garden is utilized and that the water gets a chance to infiltrate. And so I don't know about you, that, but there's not many places out there that have perfectly level yards. Um, so there's a few different options you can do for, um, for making sure your rain garden is level. Um, a lot of times we can use some of the excavated soils that we dig out in the rain garden, creating a berm. Um, that's a good way to utilize uh, the features there. Other times you can do uh, retaining walls. So whether you do something uh, more artistic with a rock or used uh, traditional um, block pavers, um, those can really help if you have significant slope on there. And like I said, that's just adding to the, the enhancement of the rain garden and making it more of an attractive feature there. Um, you have a couple options for connecting your downspouts. Um, so a common one um, for a lot of folks, you know, who uh, don't want um, water traveling above ground is to run buried tile lines. Um, so you can get these from your local hardware stores. Um, you know, they they usually come in three or four inch tile uh, diameters, and and then you're good to go. So a little bit more work with the digging, but then you that way you can mow, you know, put grass back over it. Uh, mow it just like you normally would and still have your landscaped rain garden. Another option if you do it closer to your home um, is you can do uh, a little rock shoot. Um, so this one you just kind of excavate out uh, just a few inches down, fill a little bit back up with rock to help slow the water down um, and, and just kind of create a nice channel for that water to flow to the rain garden. So either one of these you want, um, they both work. It's just the kind of that personal preference there. Uh, another important feature about the, those rain gardens to consider, um, you know, that overflow, if you have to go with an enhanced rain garden, um, making sure you get that set up. So that's where the water is going to, if the rain garden fills up, it has an overflow option. Um, otherwise, um, if you don't have to go an enhanced rain garden, you can kind of just do another rock shoot. That way, if the rain garden fills up with too much water, it has a place to go. Um, so directing in a certain area um, is important as well. Another thing, um, the inlets of the rain gardens, it's important. Um, you don't want all your plants and mulch getting washed out. Um, so sometimes armoring the inlet's important. And you can just kind of go ahead and put some rock there. Um, you can use flagstones, um, whatever you want, and that's going to help dissipate that water. Like I said, you kind of don't get that washout happen. 
And then you have making sure you kind of designate where that overflow is um, and having that, that clearly defined, that's just gonna help, um, help with that water flow. Um, another wonderful feature, another way to customize your rain garden is your prairie plants. Um, so you don't just have to use um, prairie plants. There are uh, non-native plants here um, that also work well in rain gardens. And so, um, you know, these are plants, uh, there's a few dozen plants we've kind of identified that work well in the soil types of rain gardens. Um, but some of the personal considerations you're gonna have to do is the amount of sunlight your, your plants are gonna get. You know, if you have a shaded backyard where you're putting your rain garden, you're gonna have to choose more of those shaded uh, plants. Um, we always like, we always recommend doing a diverse um, plant um, setup layout for your rain garden, um, just because that way they have something, they're blooming year round, you're helping out our local pollinators, you're making it more attractive. Um, we also recommend including some grass species, um, just having that diversity um, just really helps to ensure your rain garden is going to function better. Um, so like I said, you can check out the rain garden guide, see all these pretty pictures, and help figure out what plants you want for your rain garden there. But then the big question is where do you get uh, these plants? Um, so you can go to the, the local store, you can go to these our, our local nurseries, uh, support those staff and, and pick up some of your plants. But um, one thing that we definitely recommend as a consideration is not all the plants that, that are at the, the, the big box stores, it might say it's milkweed, but it's not necessarily Iowa milkweed. It might be the Pennsylvania strain or the Texan strain or somewhere else. Um, so we always um, recommend that folks try and look for Iowa certified locally sourced native prairie plants. Those are ones that are adapted for our soils, our, our uh, pollinators and uh, insect species here are adapted to them and they're adapted to our climates here as well. So that's where you're gonna have uh, the highest success for your plant species. Um, so these are um, some nurseries here um, in and around the state that we recommend because they do have those locally sourced Iowa certified native prairie plants. Um, so you can go ahead, I would highly recommend going out and checking out their websites. Uh, they have a plethora of information. Um, some of them do have mock rain garden designs or they have rain garden um, sets already uh, broken out for you. Um, so they really try and make it a lot easy and add a lot of those considerations for, for rain gardens. And you know what, if this sounds too much um, for you, you know, you don't have a green thumb, um, you don't want to bust out the shovel, that's just fine too. We do have some wonderful uh, local landscaping companies that do design and install rain gardens. Um, so you can go ahead and contact any one of these local landscaping companies. They can come out, um, try and assess your site, ensure that you have a good um, option for a rain garden, come up with the design, give you a cost estimate, and if you approve, you can, they can proceed with the work and make these wonderful rain gardens happen. So like I said, whether you wanna do one yourself or you want someone else to do it, there's, there's no wrong way. But that's what's gonna affect um, your cost or what your bottom line is gonna be. You know, these landscapers, they're professional contractors. They do great work. So if you want a really good looking, attractive rain garden right out of the, the box, that's probably who you should maybe consider going with. Otherwise, you know, if you're, if you don't uh, care so much, um, you know, if it's the most attractive thing in the world, you're willing to get your hands dirty and maybe save some money, that's when you can kind of try and DIY it yourself and, and come out with a rain garden. So um, a good average cost for a rain garden is about $15 a square foot. But like I said, there's lots of ways to either decrease or increase your cost to, to make it fit your budget there. And I will say based on that budget, um, there are local resources here. There are financial incentives for homeowners who do wanna install rain gardens. So if you live within the Dry Run Creek watershed in uh, Cedar Falls, you can get financial assistance up to 75% cost share for conservation practices, including rain gardens. Otherwise, all residents in Black Hawk County um, are eligible through a program called REAP, Resource Enhancement Protection, you can get 50% cost share. And then there's also low interest loans available. So that way you're maybe not paying all the cost up front and stretch it out over a few years. Um, so for any of those um, programs, 
and feel free to contact the local soil and water conservation district office and they can help get you set up and I'll have uh, that information here towards the end here. But a couple last things to consider, you know, rain gardens, it's not just once you install it, it's good to go. There is some work to do with it. And um, the new rain garden guide kind of has those detailed maintenance plans. Um, like I said, it's not significantly more than what you'd be doing if you just had basic landscaping in your backyard. Um, so, you know, you might need to add mulch, you might need to weed it out, especially those first couple of years. Um, adding water those first few months is really important. Um, but then once the rain garden's established, um, your, your maintenance load should decrease over time if you set it up properly. So, so just trying to sum things up here, you know, some a few things on why people should install rain gardens. Um, you know, this is an enhancement to your yard. Um, this is a great way to show that conservation matters to you, that water quality matters to you, and you can do it in a very attractive way. And like I said, there's that water quality benefit. You're not only helping your yard, you're helping the entire community and doing your own little parts on your own little yard. But then it has widespread benefits. You know, you're helping the community, you're helping our local pollinators who are who are in need of our help these days. And so it, all around it's it's coming back to our Iowa native heritage and really kind of bringing it uh, full circle and helping out. So uh, if you're uh, interested um, about this, um, there, there's, I would say that uh, you should check out iowastormwater.org. You can download lots of great resources on there. You can download that rain garden guide. Um, but then if you're interested in any other conservation projects, they have wonderful brochures there as well. So, uh, a lot of a wealth of information. Otherwise, you can also go to Cedar Falls City Hall and um, they have these displayed right outside the engineering office. Um, so you can go ahead, check those out. And then there's a couple upcoming um, learning opportunities if you're interested. Next week, there'll be an in-depth rain garden training. You know, I'm just giving you a crash course in it. Um, but if you're really interested um, in rain gardens, you can go ahead and register for this free rain garden training. Um, I think I might have heard that um, registration is full. We have over 250 people signed up for this, but you can still register for it. And I think their 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 hope is to try and make um, it available as a recorded webinar, or maybe provide information for folks who are interested. So, like I said, go ahead and check out um, iowastormwater.org. You can get linked to this information. And then coming up in a few weeks here, um, the wonderful panelists I'm joined with this evening are also helping out with uh, the Cedar Valley Community Conservation Workshop. Um, so that will also be a virtual Zoom meeting here um, scheduled for Thursday, February 25th in the evening. Uh, it's gonna be a really big crash course and a diverse amount of topics, including rain gardens, rain barrels, but also talk about um, uh, sustainable gardening for being good neighbor Iowa, backyard composting, um, just uh, sustainable houses and what you can do to make your house energy efficient. So I would definitely recommend um, go ahead and check that out. Um, you can go ahead and get registered for that. That's also free and open to the public. And then there's um, prize drawing giveaways for attendees that, that come to that as well. All right. Well, I definitely feel like I've talked enough. Um, so We'll go ahead and take any questions that folks may have. And, and yep, I'll leave my contact information up there in case you have uh, any, any other questions you want to submit our way. So we've received one question asking about, uh, is there a rule of thumb of how big or small you should go? Like for example, with acreage. So, yep, um, that, that's a great question. And, Usually we, we, we've installed rain gardens, I'd say probably up to about 200 square feet. Um, getting much larger than that, we might be looking at something else, um, either an enhanced rain garden or what's called a bioretention cell. Maria had a photo of that, so the recently one installed one at Clay Street Park. And you know, and that's draining multiple acres of land coming through that, that bioretention cell. So that one's really big. Um, and these bio cells, they kind of look the same like rain gardens on top, but underneath they have a lot more engineering. You know, they're digging down three or four feet, adding lots of rock in there, more um, amended soils. 
Um, so like I said, yeah, if, if you have a significant drainage area coming through your area, um, you might look at an enhanced rain garden or a bioretention cell. Um, but otherwise, yep, you know, if you have, you know, maybe 2,000 square feet kind of draining to your rain garden, um, that's just fine. You get much bigger than that, that's when you might look at one of those other options instead. All right, Do if we don't have any other questions, do we have any other questions? All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, I just wanna thank the panelists, Josh and Rhea, and, our, and the help Felix from Green Iowa. And uh, just to let you know, uh, this is the, the first webinar in our series. We did put out uh, a video uh, last week about building bad boxes if you're interested. Uh, that'll be on, uh, uh, Green Iowa's YouTube page and Cedar Falls Seed Library's Facebook page. Um, we do have two more webinars for sure coming up. Uh, next Thursday, uh, the 11th, we'll have a composting webinar with Tammy Turner from Waste Track. And that is already on the Cedar Falls Public Library website and the Seed Library Facebook page if you want to register. And then Thursday after that, uh, February 18th, uh, Linda Nebbe uh, with Blackhawk Wildlife Rehabilitation uh, will be giving a webinar. Uh, we're still working on the registration for that, but just keep an eye out. Uh, the Seed Library um, email list, Seed Library Facebook page, and the Cedar Falls Public Library website. It'll be on there. Um, so hope to see you there. And again, thank you all that attended and to our panelists. Hope you have a good night. Stay warm. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody.